Great. Let's go ahead and get started. By way of introduction, I'm Dana Zivkovich, and I organize the Friendly Lawyers. We're a Chicago-based social network for attorneys who run their own practices, so typically solo or very small firm attorneys. When, when you're the attorney that's basically running the business, doing the work, paying payroll, and taking out the garbage, that's what this group is about. It's to help one another uh, collaborate, share ideas, and succeed. So we started these webinars when everybody here went into quarantine to try and continue to share ideas um, to help make your business grow and, and survive during this time. And the word is getting out now that uh, we are doing these more regularly. And we, by the way, we apply, we apply for CLE credit for all of them. So pending approval, we will um, deliver certificates to you by email. They are only approved in the state of Illinois though. Now, today we are going to be talking with Allison Henderson. Allison uh, brings a lot of expertise about body language. She has a background um, in theater and she has learned how to coach people to use their body language in business settings and business transactions and what that could mean. So I'm excited to turn it over to her so that she can um, start her presentation. But a couple of notes for you in our webinar, we have a right side chat box that I will try to encourage you to use. Feel free to ask any questions at any time during the presentation. We want this to be as much of a dialogue as we can. So it's not a problem at all. If you have something to say or share with the rest of the group, I, I would like to see that. Um, also, we have a couple polls that we'll be putting on during the next hour and I'll be sharing those results with you. Okay, so Allison. I'm gonna hand it over to you. And I'm gonna move us down into the slides to get that up on the screen for you. Great. So everybody, you should still be able to see us in thumbnail, which is great. We will be going back and forth between uh, slides and live demo and things as we go along today because this is body language. The Best thing for you guys is that don't worry, we can't see you. Uh, so it makes it a little bit awkward sometimes for me because I love to be able to see the folks that I'm uh, talking to, but you don't have to worry about uh, moving or not moving. And I do encourage you, however, to try on the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, today because that's the best way for you to really learn them and to internalize them is to actually try it on yourself. So we're going to be talking about what I uh, have affectionately started calling uh, Brady Bunch body language because uh, when everybody turned virtual, your box is equal to everybody else's box. And uh, that creates some challenges as far as keeping your executive presence perhaps in the relationship that you have with, uh, with your clients or with consultants or other folks that you use to help you run your business. I'm basically treating this as small business, as in you are the, uh, as Dana said, chief cook and bottle washer for your, for your firm, or maybe you just have like a partnership or there's just a couple of you in it. So that's, um, that's where I'm going to be coming from today is, is really talking about this idea of solo. Uh, so, Let's get to. Are we going back to the slides? <laughs> yep, I, I, I'm getting the hang of it. Here I we go. I just figured it out. <laughs> How to get so your just, face. And yeah, then... just a Sorry little bit that. more of about me. I mean, Dana did a great job of of um, introducing me. I do, as she said, come from a theater background. So the uh, I had been an artistic director. I've done a lot of work with with theater companies and a lot of work with development and nonprofits. And I was doing that day job to support my theater habit thing years ago and realizing there was a lot more drama going on in my office than there was on my stage at night. And what could I bring to the table? And I had certifications already in body language training, but I decided to go back and get a further certification in what's called movement pattern analysis. I am one of 22 in the world world that are certified in this specific observation technique of 
of body language and what it means to the decision making process. How can you tell what somebody's thinking or what they need from you as a decision maker uh, based on their body language? So most of my time is spent working with with teams or with individuals on that body language piece, both the signals you send and the signals that you receive from others. Now, of course, whoop, I've been doing a lot of talk about what we're talking about today, which is virtual communication. What does it mean when you only see somebody from the chest up? In fact, um, I'll put a little plug in for my TEDx talk that is going to be live streamed on June 28th. If you go to TEDxWrigleyville.com, I have an entire TED talk on virtual communication wow. and some tips. So that is exciting. Uh, so like the exciting. There are, uh, the whole theme is COVID-19. We filmed last week at Wrigleyville. Uh, in at, at Wrigley Stadium in Wrigleyville on Thursday. We had to postpone from Tuesday because of the protests. And yeah, so you can li see the live stream. I believe it starts at like 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. on that Sunday. And it's probably about five hours worth of content. Many of the talks are very, very excellent because I was also their coach for, uh, for their presentation. So uh, I didn't do the content piece. I did the presentation side, but I seen all of the talks and really some of them are, are truly, truly excellent. I think will go viral. So put that on your calendars if you uh, if you want. And real quick, you said that was June 28th? June 28th. Uh, it's, I believe it's just www.tedxwrigleyville.com. And there's a button there that you can hit to get your tickets because, of course, it's free. Uh, and uh, okay. they, the live stream's on the 28th. So. June 28th, live stream, TEDxWrigleyville.com. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat. And you said it was at what time? I want to say it starts at 9, but don't totally quote me on that. Um, <laughs> and I don't know where I am in the order. They haven't. Okay. I haven't gotten an order yet from them. So uh, I can't tell you whether to, you know, tune okay. in. Well, or, yeah. Thanks for that yeah. information. I'm yeah. Excited. So link in with me, all of you. If we're not already LinkedIn buddies, and I recognize some of you, so hi to, to Jim and to Amy, uh, that I think we're already um, LinkedIn friends, but I, I'll be posting in there, so you'll have a better idea of the time. Okay. Yeah. All right, this is leading into our first poll. So the question is, who do you think is the leader of this particular meeting? You think it's number one, number two, or number three? I kept it to just that top row, okay. because when I ask this question, these those are the top three that usually come out uh, to me. And so go ahead and put uh, answer your poll. I don't know if the question comes up or whether- I'm about to pull it up. Great. So. This is what most Zoom calls kind of look like, right? Uh, a lot of variance in background, in lighting, in body language. What you can even see is you notice that number nine is like his head started to be cut off. Number six there is super grainy. We can't even hardly see her face. And then there's a lot of that kind of resting um, uh, board face or whatever you want. <laughs> Uh, RBF going on with this uh, with this particular snapshot, and so it's funny. I had taken this off of LinkedIn, and of course, I covered up everybody's names and things, and figured, well, if I'm only using it on webinars and I'm not um, free webinars and I'm not profiting from it, I'm pro I hope I'm okay <laughs> to use the the image because somebody already already posted it on LinkedIn, and then finally, somebody got back to me and was like recognized the meeting and did tell me who the leader is. So when everybody is answered into the poll, I can actually tell you who the who the leader is. So we'll go back to it in a minute. Um, just a time, we really don't have to do a whole lot more about movement pattern analysis because everything that I do is always filtered through this lens of this particular observation technique. What I really want to get across and have everybody start thinking about is that the idea of how much of our communication is nonverbal. And even through the Zoom screen, we do need to be conscious of it, even more so, I think, sometimes with the virtual communication, because there's so much that we don't see. But what we do see is usually pretty clear, and it's also amplified. Right. When you are when you're only seeing that person and their head is huge because it's just you and them on the screen and all you see is this this much. You can really focus and read a lot more than you think. 
Uh, and then, yeah, and it's all verified. If you really want the scientific studies, go to my website and um, and have a meeting. Uh, so it's a and real is, thing. Uh, yeah, as so far what is as, your website? Uh, Movingimageconsulting.com. Okay, I'm typing it into the chat for anybody oh. who wants to take, check Great. it out. Uh, so today we're going to be focusing basically on, on three things, which is you and your square, your Brady Bunch head, uh, the environment that you're in, the physical presence, and then we are going to touch on, uh, time permitting, uh, <laughs> usually I get that far, to the communication piece, to a little bit of the verbal. We're not minds, right? We're not just in our, you know, in our screen without talking. So we can't ignore the verbal piece when we're doing these kinds of discussions. So don't worry, as a body language person, I'm never going to only talk about body. It's always connected to the verbal uh, piece as well. So let's go back a little bit. What's, uh, what is the poll saying here? If I go back, um, ooh, 50% for three. I, and uh, honestly, it is, um, Number two is actually the leader of the meeting. Okay, so interestingly, in our poll results, number one had 33% of the vote, number two had the fewest uh, votes at 16%, and number three had the most votes at 50%. So your environment, this leads really great into the next thing that we're gonna be talking about, the environment does make a difference. One in three look more professional because their background is a little bit cleaner, is a little bit, um, it just has that professional feeling where, of course, number five, I don't know if she's in a closet, like where is she, all these persons <laughs> hanging on the wall. But, but the actual leader, number two, the only reason maybe he looks more leader-like is because he's got the fancy headset, but his background, his environment, right, those messy shelves are really distracting. So one of the first things that uh, many of, the uh, blogs and things that are out there are at least addressing is the background and the lighting for your meetings. And I'm uh, going to so, ask people mm -hmm. real quick while you continue with the presentation, if you want to throw in what reason you had for your selection, I think that would be interesting to see what people, um, what caused people to vote for who they thought was the leader. Yeah, I would love to know what, what influenced you, for sure. Uh, background and lighting. It's, it does really make a difference, particularly with that first impression. When you are meeting with a potential client on Zoom or when you're meeting with a current client, it just keeps that relationship, A, professional if, you know, if need be, or you can you have the ability to also change, obviously, your background. I'm not talking about literally changing to all the, the funny backgrounds that are out there. Um, you can, if you want to, uh, you know, use those virtual backgrounds. I will say, though, you do need to, to experiment with virtual backgrounds because I'm sure you've been on Zoom calls where people get really pixelated and they go in and out of the screen because they... Uh, where they are in relation to the camera changes. And that is something that can happen with the virtual backgrounds. So use a virtual background if you need to. I always think it's a little like, well, what are you hiding? Or like, where are you if, if you have a virtual background? But that's me. Uh, as we saw in that picture, avoid the messy office look, obviously. One thing that you do want to do, however, is have something behind you if, um, if possible, if in order to just help ground you in the space sometimes, uh, and then you're not you're not floating as much. Um, the other thing we can you should be thinking about is your lighting. Always, of course, put the lighting in front of you. If you have the lighting behind you, it puts you in silhouette and makes you are really shadowed, and that's that that's not so good. You don't have to necessarily buy a ring light or any additional lighting. I have additional lighting because I'm doing so many of these uh, webinars and things. And so it just helps me if I don't have a lot of natural light coming from the window that's that's to the side here. But um, one of my hacks for this is uh, I love my black music stand. You know, those old fashioned music stands from school that uh, you can put your laptop or your camera right on there. And then you can run around the house and find the best lighting right before your call. 
<laughs> and and or and sit or you can you have then your desk in a different part. Maybe you want to sit in your living room and have this really great leather chair behind you or something. Um, so one of the things that I sometimes do, if, particularly if it's an early morning meeting, the light in my house isn't so great in the early morning. So I will take, I have literally have my music stand and I run around and I find where the best light is and that's where I do my, uh, my talk from. So a little hack uh, for that. And it also, you can raise it up and lower it to be the perfect height because that's one of the other things that you want to do is you want to get your computer up to where we're more eye to eye. So we have a really good demo here that we really look like we're coming at you uh, eye to eye. I'm not way low. I'm sure you've seen those folks like, that have, that have a weird, ones, yeah, what, like people so that are seeing neck, you know, you don't want to see somebody's neck or just up their nose the entire time. And you also don't want to lure it over them by being higher than, you know, uh, so there really, it is this, this looking eye to eye kind of thing. Many of the blogs and things that I read talk about looking into the camera, and I, I go both ways on that. Um, That's sometimes hard to do, actually. I think it's I think it is really hard to do, and then you're not seeing the body language of the people that you're with because you're looking in the little dot. So, uh, personally, I think it's fine to engage with the person's face because then if you're just both engaging with faces, we're not looking eye to eye. There's no way that physically, obviously we're not. So why look at a dot instead of at the person? Uh, you Then you can see their body language. You can take that in, you can use it to your advantage. So I personally, yeah, don't worry so much about, about the camera thing. I do think you, you can move back. I am not really a proponent of this kind of thing at all because the less, you show people the more um uh, the less they trust you honestly because we trust what we can see and we don't trust what we can't see so if you can scooch back enough to even if you can as you can see I, you can see my gestures i have to raise them up in order for them to be seen but you know that i'm here and i'm with you and i'm gesturing and it looks more like a regular old coffee talk than just your face so and the more I you can I'm back. sorry to interrupt, mm -hmm. but I was going to say, I noticed when I was talking to you a couple times, um, you're the first person out of various meetings and webinars and um, these Zoom calls, the Zoom type, I should say, calls, where you are like all the way back here. <laughs> you know, most people like almost are fit right. the screen. Uh -huh. And um, I think it's very interesting that you make that point about. If they can see, you know, a quarter of you, then that might make them feel more comfortable because they're able to see more. And we all like, you know, to have, you know, we all feel more comfortable if we can see things. That's why everybody doesn't like to be in the dark alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And the same thing with um, just not feeling quite so stared at. That's one of the things that raises our anxiety or, or creates that Zoom fatigue that everybody's talking about is that you also feel watched the entire time. Uh, so if you don't know about turning off your own um, your own screen to yourself uh, on whatever platform you use, I don't know if it works in Microsoft Teams and, and in, I think you could do it in Google Meets, but for sure on Zoom, you can go into the top right of your little box where it says mute and unmute. And there's a little blue thing that has three dots on it. Click on the three dots, a little screen will drop down and it will say like hide, hide my view or something to that effect. And that literally takes your picture off the screen. So you don't have to at least watch yourself talking, which a lot of people find disconcerting and they don't like. So that's a little tip too. You can take yourself out of it. Make sure that you look good and the lighting's good and you're sitting okay before you do that because suddenly you could be off the screen and you don't know it. But that is something you have control over that they hide. I don't know why it's so hidden, but it's really kind of a hidden trick. Um, yeah, so back, lighting, all that good stuff. That way your first impression is, okay, we are professionals. Uh, one of the other things about being scooched back to is it helps with that whole looking into the camera thing because you can really just look at the person. There's not as big a difference of looking at the camera and looking at the person when you're scooched back. It just gives you a little bit more distance. So let me go back to the slide, see how far off of my... Uh, game I am, how far off I've gotten. Uh, oh yeah, don't match your background. That's probably pretty self-explanatory, but I have seen people that 
are sitting and they, you know, when they match their background, just like those of you that do public speaking, when you go into the, the room, if you're wearing an all black suit and they have a black curtain that you're standing in front of, you're a, you know, a talking head now and you're just floating there. So you want to bounce off and be as vibrant as you can in your screen. Particularly if you're doing uh, like media interviews, I've been coaching some people for their Zoom media interviews. And the first thing I told the one gentleman was, you need to invest in a bright blue shirt. Like you, <laughs> you have to get some color on you because you're against the beige background and you're bald and you're a bald white man against the beige background and you're wearing a beige shirt. Not, not happening. So <laughs> think about your background and what you're wearing. Uh, sit back and eye to eye. We talk about all of these things. Lifting the computer. Good. Yay. If you can, I am a proponent of taking off glasses because of the glare. If you can't see without them, you can take them off when you're doing the majority of the talking and then slide them back on when you're doing the majority of the listening, potentially. But that glare, I know, I'm sure we've all seen it with some of the reporters that have now all gone to Zoom and some of those reporters are still wearing their glasses and it's really disconcerting to have all the glare from all the lights. So you can experiment with where your light needs to be to reduce the glare on there. Uh, these are just some other folks, some other pictures of what a Zoom call might look like. Most of these guys are better than the first one, honestly. Uh, but we still have our, our little red arrow dude. You know, he's just, he's way back, but he didn't adjust <laughs> so that uh, so that he's big in the screen. It's weird that he you can see more of him, but he's teeny tiny. Um, the blue arrow gal, that's an example of a background. And notice the bit, the really strong, like, cutout head that she has because of what those backgrounds do to you. Um, the yellow gal, she's closer. It's still kind of an of a neck shot slightly, but at least her background is kind of clear. And um, one trick you can do is you notice how she's there and it's like all of the angles of things are kind of coming in towards her. Uh, the the lines of the, the subtle lines in the space are pointing towards her head. That's kind of another trick you can do too, to be have more prominence and have people watch stare at you is follow the lines of things that are hanging on your wall. Um, oh, so let's see, did people put in the chat uh, why they chose who they chose? Let's oh, see. Three was speaking. Uh, yeah, I see someone two webinars said, that looked like she did. Uh huh. Number three was talking. Number one looked bemused, while number two looked bored. So that is a statement to exactly what your face is doing, you know. And then that snapshot, yeah. um, you're going to make an impression. And, and those first impressions, right, with that, are are big, right? Yeah, and then number one looked most in control. That comment came through too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna ask a question for people to answer in the chat as you go into this next bullet point. And that question is, what is your biggest pet peeve when it comes to these virtual calls? It can be something like the camera angle bothers you, the lighting that people use, the sound is annoying, or if there's something else that is a pet peeve, let us know. Yeah, that's always good information to know as to what what people think is the most egregious <laughs> of things that they can do. So we covered that environment piece. Now we're moving on into this physical presence, how you are physically showing up in the screen. And the number one thing that I tell everybody for live and virtual, my number one tip is always the same, fix your posture. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I need to just have a crusade or, or make myself a t-shirt, you know, that says stand up straight. Uh, we do so much right with our phones and with we, the posture as a nation is changing to be kind of this weird hunched over thing. But the minute you sit up, you have so much more presence. People want to believe you. They're going to look to, to you. Uh, and at least those top three folks in the in the picture, they also had the, the best posture of most of the people on the call. They weren't just sitting like this. 
And this definitely gives the board less energy kind of feeling. And if you are the executive, I always say to be the boss, you have to look like the boss because of that perception. So if you want somebody to know that you are interested and you're listening to what they have to say or that if they're a potential client and you want them to get that you are listening and engaged, just doesn't mean that you have to be military about it or something, but just keep that spine a little bit straighter and that goes a long way to helping you with your first impression. And it also helps with your energy. So posture and energy really go together because one thing that happens on all of these virtual calls is the camera flattens us. We go from being a 3D person to a 2D person uh, on the screen. And so we have to up our energy a little bit in order to still look like the, the you they know when they come to your office. You have to up your energy just a little bit. And it's great for you to know that, but then also to realize that if you think the person that you're talking with is not very engaged or seems really tired or bored or uh, something, just remember they may not actually be. It may be this kind of decrease of energy that comes across the screen. So I am presenting as if I am talking to a group of say 50 people in the room that with that kind of energy level so that I am engaging versus just giving the webinar, you know, what I might do if I was just sitting with you at the coffee shop, I would be talking more like this because um, I, I tend to be pretty animated anyway. <laughs> but when I'm doing, pre when I'm presenting, even through virtual, I want all those body language signals to come through to you. And, uh, and we're gonna talk about the- So what I hear- signals just to make sure that I'm following. Mm -hmm. What I hear you to say is that you've got to bring the energy level up on these online, um, in these online meetings. And to do that, some of the things you can do besides the color and the contrast is posture up and be a little, if you're someone who talks with their hands or if you're someone who moves their head, you want to possibly be conscious of exaggerating that a little more than your normal, is, is that? Kind of yeah, what I hear you saying exactly. In order it just comes through, bump it up just a little bit. I'll really as if you know, instead of a one on one, maybe you're talking, you're in the conference room and you have the board, you know, we have five people in the room that you're presenting to. It's kind of like for those of us that are old enough to remember the difference between a 33 record and a 45, like it's not a ton of speed or it's not a ton of, of, of going up, but just just a little bit of oomph will go a long way into keeping everybody engaged on the call. And it's also helps to be a little bit more contagious. Uh, one of the things that people always talk about is how they don't they don't feel the energy of the room or they don't feel the energy of the interaction. That's the biggest thing that's missing from the connection on Zoom or uh, Google Meets or whatever other service you're using is that we physically don't have any of that energy. So you can kind of supplement that or kind of fake it a little bit. With a little bit more movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just okay. a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. So instead of, I mean, uh, one way that I can think about it is instead of just coming in completely relaxed, my um, goal is to actually try and create a bit of energy by being more engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that will help you look like you. Because I know when we've met in person, we had so much energy and there was such great rapport going on. And then you want to keep that um, probably not so much for those of you with your clients, um, but with the other people that you work with. If you have a team or if you have a virtual assistant or somebody that you work really closely with. Those people that really know us because they work with us day to day, what ends up happening is when you don't come across with as much energy. We immediately think, oh no, what's wrong? Um, can I help you? Is something going on? Is somebody in your family sick uh, dur you know, during this time? Where you are, is your business failing? Like we, we go down that rabbit hole of negativity because we feel that there's a lack of energy or that something something is wrong with the other person because we're not seeing them how we normally interact with them or the feeling that we normally get from them. And it's just a 
it's just a fact of virtual communication that we are and our brains are geared to go negative we just it's our survival mechanism right uh if if you hear something snap in the woods you better react like it's a bear and not a squirrel because if you're going to survive in the woods you know as a caveman or something we had to pretend that it was a bear outside and that still is in our limbic brain our what they call that reptilian brain that deals with our fight or flight we still have that going on so we immediately think oh no and go negative usually versus thinking oh well it's just the virtual the virtual call like our mm -hmm. brains think oh no what's wrong okay. uh let's take a look at what people were saying are their pet peeves these are fun uh, yeah while um you're looking at those real quick i'll just say that my pet peeve is when someone has a scheduled call or meeting with you and you know then their phone starts ringing and then they answer it you know i'm just like wait a minute <laughs> i don't think this would be happening if we were in my office i mean i understand some people forget to turn off their phone but i feel like it should be one of those things if you're going into an online meeting and you're already setting up all of these things you know you've got your webcam on you need to have your audio you're kind of thinking about it more critically i feel like um you should also remember to put aside the phone that's a personal pet right thing. well and usually the excuse is oh it could be the babysitter or, or oh it's my kids well aren't they at home with you right <laughs> right now i don't know that that's your excuse so uh, and amy yeah. mentions that mute is her pet peeve not using it you know when mm. kids or pets are loud or when eating or not unmuting before speaking so i think we're kind of talking a little bit about the same thing it's just that uh noise distraction and um, Erica mentions that the camera angle bugs her you know if it's looking up people's nostrils or you know looking straight down at them yeah so I think <laughs> yeah I think both angle. of those are pretty common yep uh, oh people yelling into the camera Nancy says because they don't realize we can hear you with an inside voice yeah that one's funny too the whole can you hear me now um, kind of thing and i think sometimes that's because they need to turn up their own volume on the computer so they can hear everybody else better and they think they're not hearing anybody very well and so then they raise their voice because they can't hear you so definitely be aware of all those things and yes mute is certainly your friend uh, i am a big proponent of mute and i always no matter what version i'm on or what what kind of meeting thing my first check is where's the mute button <laughs> Yeah, so I and, know where it is. You know, and keep, my, these, keep my mouth poised at the mute. Um, yeah, because that can be a real issue. Some of these things that you have mentioned are applicable in all cases. But now you got me thinking when you said uh, perhaps with your clients, you don't want to be as dramatic. OK, so now that leads me to think I need to consider what if I'm going to be doing a hearing online it you know uh with a judge or maybe opposing counsel you know and and do you have any kind of guidelines in specific scenarios like for example i recommend when you're having an online meeting for clients that you do x or if you are on a call with other colleagues and i i feel like some of the stuff you talked about uh just now had to do with when you're taking or uh being on meetings with with colleagues but do you have different advice for different audiences um the one thing that i would say about the uh like kind of work like if you're actually in like court court setting uh now virtually on zoom i would take um and take a little bit of, of the lead from whoever is the judge, whoever is the highest ranking on the call, if that makes sense. So that, um, and I always tell everybody this, like you can be any of the person that's sitting back the furthest, but if nobody else, like if nobody else is showing that, like you probably want to find a happy medium where you're still showing as much as you can, but that you don't look like you're not participating because you're sitting okay. so far back. If you can get your entire team to scooch back a little bit and to be more relaxed about uh, 
the size of people um, on the screen. And I know some people have to still have to type, so it's hard to be that far back. I actually cheat and I put my mouse on a little side table so that I can still click around my screen and share my screen if I don't need to be typing so that I can have that space from, from the computer. But um, it's kind of the same thing with energy because in court they may want, you know, there's still that decorum feeling that you want to have. But I would still err on being, you know, you look at how everybody else is being and I would be just that much more. I would be the one that, um, I don't want to say sticks out because that's not what I'm, what I really mean, but, but you just you, want to be you will be listened I, I to you're, more. You're saying you, you just are want to be noticeable. Yes. You want people to be listening to you. So one trick is you could be very calm when other people are speaking, but when you start to speak when it's your turn to, so that people can find you, find the person that's talking. If there's multiple squares going on, yes, they can follow the little, you know, box that lights up. But as you start to speak, do it, make sure that you do a gesture because that will draw the eye to, oh, okay, this person's talking now. Uh, you would do that in the courtroom anyway, but sometimes I think on, in virtual, we get a little bit lazy and then we just we just turn on our voice, but then they don't know who's talking. And it's like, oh, wait, no, who, who's talking? Which one's lit up? And so you to make sure that somebody knows you're the one that's talking and you're commanding the room right now. It also helps that little uh, uptick of, of energy or that little bit of gesture will also help people coming in and starting to talk with you and, or talk over you because you've signaled that you're now going to talk. It, so just just ahead of speaking. Uh, we get that feeling in a room of the intake of breath. We see somebody prepare to speak. And so we don't have as much overlap. But on Zoom, there tends to be everybody starts speaking at once because the minute somebody stops talking, somebody else jumps in. And you can help your own self by popping in. That's a good point that I should put on the notes that I don't think I have on there. Uh, I'm going to make myself a note. <laughs> Because <laughs> everybody will get a sheet. I will send Dana uh, like highlights of everything we talked about. And uh, so that will be. And it seems like uh, you've mentioned color um, a couple times. So I have a question about uh, is there any research behind colors and impressions, symbols? Do you. Do you match or do you think people should bother thinking about color inside of these virtual meetings? Um, I think it still needs to work with you and it doesn't. Um, one of the reasons why I have a jacket on today is to demonstrate something that's coming up. Normally, this is a little formal for, you know, this kind of webinar where we're all gathering together on a Friday, but it's actually <laughs> it's purposeful. Uh, but uh yeah, you know, I would still, you know, obviously dress professionally if it's a professional call. Uh, color wise, you still want to be you. So as long as you're not um, sitting in front of a navy blue background wearing your navy blue suit, you're probably okay. okay so, for, so for you, contrast is the bigger important takeaway. Right. So that color, you pop you up the color really thing. matters uh, in in one way or another, as long as it's flattering. You know, yeah. as long as you like it, you find it flattering. And you, yeah, you find that you're confident in it. If you're not confident in what you're wearing, then you shouldn't wear it. Even if somebody told you that that's what you should be wearing, if that doesn't make you confident, then, you know, go against their okay. suggestion. Right. Um, all right. What time are we at? 40 minutes. Okay. I'm going to go back into the slides here. So we'll wrap up your energy. Okay. Oh, smiling, which I think we've already demoed uh, and talked about with the, uh, you saw all those people on the screen and you don't have to feel fake. Some one of, sometimes I get the reaction of, oh, but I feel so fake or it looks cheesy if I'm constantly smiling. It's not the actual smile. It's just that you keep enough pleasant thoughts going through your head that everything doesn't sink. What happens is we start concentrating and we start thinking and and everything comes to this very like low, low place. All right. It comes forward because we're, I'm bringing we're you back just so that we can yeah, see exactly, exactly yeah. what you're so, talking so about. We're thinking and, we're, and we're thinking and we're pondering and we're considering and that's okay. As long as again, 
people aren't thinking, oh, they're angry, they're upset, because those most people aren't um, trained in microfacial expressions. And so the the way or, or what all of these facial expressions mean and whether, oh, oh well, no, no, because you know their their eyes are still engaged, so they're engaged. And there's a lot of little nuances, and I'm not even um, I'm not certified in in microfacial expressions myself. I've done a lot of reading on it, but it's something that we start. We make all sorts of assumptions, just like we saw with with those three people. This person looked bored. This person uh, looked in charge. This person was speaking. Everybody's making those kind of assumptions all the time. So as long as you're still pleasantly engaged or, or keeping okay thoughts, you know, it doesn't have to be that you're sitting there like this because that's weird. <laughs> that's freaky, right? That's clown-like. So it, it's just remembering to kind of, okay, this deposition's going okay or this witness is doing all right. Or even in the courtroom, you know, again, live, it, it probably behooves you to be thinking about what is my face looking like right now because there is a juror somewhere or there is somebody in the courtroom who's looking at me right now. And that's the thing that you can't control on Zoom. You don't know where your box is and whether your box is big or small uh, for somebody it, um, on the other side. They could be in speaker mode and they're not seeing you if you're not talking. But you know, if, as soon as you click your pen, it goes to you because it picks up it picks up something that that's going on in your environment. If you haven't muted yourself, you will flash up for just clearing your throat or something because the computer thinks that you're talking now. And so you may have some odd expression on your face. So it, uh, just to keep in the back of your mind, pleasant expression. I, you know, I'm sure that's where some of the um, fatigue comes in because of that cognition that we are being watched more closely on the camera. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, there's finally the neuroscientists are starting to do a lot of actual research on this. And the, the fact that people don't like to be watched is a bigger deal than um, than I think people were giving credit for at the beginning, uh, which is why the shorter meetings are becoming more popular or letting people have their screen off during meetings is becoming more popular or part parts of the meeting are on and parts of the meeting are off screen to deal with that fatigue, for sure. Ah, oh, this is the part everybody's really gonna wanna know. <laughs> okay, so the only thing you're really seeing, I do a lot of shoulder talk right, right now. Um, even with the mask, and when you guys get back into the courtroom, if you have to use masks, that's gonna be a whole nother body language discussion is what to be doing when you're wearing a mask because, you immediately look like you're you're robbing a bank as soon as you put the mask on. You're muffled. Nobody can understand you when you're wearing a mask, so you have to enunciate more. There's lots of things with mask behavior, and I encourage you if if you think if you're thinking during this talk of oh this firm that I used to work for before I left them man <laughs> they need this talk you know feel free to refer me always right. So this is shoulder persuasion. This is movement pattern analysis theory, guys. There are three stages of decision making. There's the information gathering stage, which I call the researcher. There is the evaluation stage. Are we going to make this decision? Should we or shouldn't we? Which I call the judgment. They call, I call it the judge because of the judgment, not because I work with lawyers. <laughs> but uh, And the action hero is the commitment side of the decision. So you're either research, you're either gathering information, you're deciding what to do, or you're doing it, basically, are the three stages. This comes from psychology. This isn't movement pattern analysis. Movement pattern analysis figured out what we physically do when we're in each of those stages from psychology. So if you are seeing a lot of twisting, that is a an information giving or, or begging to receive. Do you see it? It's like an opening and closing. I'm like opening and it's so there, if there's a twist going on to the shoulders and they stay pretty much level, but you see a lot of twisting with your clients or uh, you yourself, if you need information, you can signal with a little bit of a twisting going on. Because that will uh, basically, as you give information and receive information, so 
for instance, verbally, if you need information from somebody, you could say, in order for me to do, um, to make this proposal for you, or in order to adjust this contract, I need some more information. Could you check your email and make sure that you get back to me my list of questions? And that signal, if they start to empathetically move with you, that will also be telling their brain, oh, that's right, I need to give them information, okay? Mm -hmm. If they tip, if there's a lot of him and hawing going on. So one of the other mm -hmm. reasons why I call it the judge is because of the scales of justice. Literally, if you ask somebody to evaluate something, which restaurant is better? The mm -hmm. Italian or the Mexican? <laughs> People will I immediately go. I oh. always do the tip. Yep, you're they're immediately going to tip. So it's a good party game. You can ask questions, and get everybody around you tipping. Uh, In fact, if you're when, seeing that if from I present something person, to my dog, yeah. if I present like a funny noise to my dog, he too goes like this. Mm -hmm. You know, what are what are you doing? What are you saying? Because he's trying to evaluate literally what's going on. We do the same thing. And if so, if you're seeing a lot of tipping from coming from your client, they're evaluating right now or a potential client, particularly. Should I do this? Should I not? Should I engage with this person? Is it worth the money? Oh, maybe I don't really need to update my will right now. Maybe the way it is is okay. You know, <laughs> who knows? Like what the situation mm -hmm. is. But if you see a lot of kind of tipping going on, it's probably an evaluative. That's the stage of decision making they're in is evaluating. The same thing, if you need somebody to evaluate, if you've given them all sorts of information and gosh darn it, could you just make a decision? Like we've, this is our third talk, talk and you still haven't decided whether you're going to engage with me or not, this is the end. <laughs> like you decide now. You can add some tipping to your own movements to encourage them to go into this decision-making stage. Thirdly, if there's a lot of forward and backward, this is the easiest to see on Zoom because they get bigger and they get smaller and they get bigger and they get smaller uh, because they're leaning in. That's this want to be in action. It looks a little like they've got ants in their pants or they have to go to the bathroom or something on Zoom, but it really is a signal of action, of action steps. So similarly, if you need somebody to take action or do something, you can emphasize it by leaning in. Okay, so our next steps are X, Y, Z. This is what I need you to do. I have to have this by this date in order for you know, this to go through. Or, you know, or we're back in action now. Courts are opening or, you know, things are opening up. I need this documentation. So you can emphasize it. One thing we don't see through Zoom very well is pressure. And that's what we use a lot for persuasion in real life is pressure. One way to add pressure because we, we don't see it very well through Zoom, or a lot of people use pressure through their legs and things that we don't see, or they're gesturing, but I, you can't see my hands right now. You don't know that I'm like visibly going, oh my gosh, could you please give me this information, which is what might happen from somebody, but if you can't see it, then it doesn't exist on Zoom. So you can lean in. It's it's sort of like sharing, even sharing a secret. You can even get softer with your voice, but this is what I really need you to do. <laughs> Because <laughs> you just always them, right. Because it's always a lean in. There, yes. Is there is there a uh, corresponding um, backup message sent by backing <laughs> up? Yeah, um, and this is one thing that you may see with that potential client is when they recline, you think, oh, I've lost them, right? Because they're not leaning in anymore. What they may actually be saying is, oh my gosh, thank you, you're the answer to my prayers. Yes. yes. So don't, if they, if they lean away from you, don't assume that they're not interested. Uh, but you can also, you can recline and that will give the same signal in a way. It's a little bit different on Zoom. It works better in real life. But you can kind of, you know, recline because that might make the other person go, uh-oh, they're not going to take my case or uh-oh. Uh, I, I guess I really have to do this because it's similarly to when somebody walks away from you, right? And they're and they're like, I'm done with this, and they walk up and they storm out of the out of the restaurant or something. So they may think that you are literally leaving the interaction because you're doing that, which could get them to take action because you're you've gone further away from them. And they're like, no, 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 I really want you to. 
So if particularly if you lean back and then they lean forward, you know, you've got them. You know that they're going to do what you want them to do because they took that signal of you going, no, this is what I really need. Basically balls in your core. Oh, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll go do that. <laughs> right. Because they don't want you not to do whatever it is that you said you, that you're supposed to do. Right. As their attorney, they, they need you. They, and so uh, you might see that as well. And so that's a tactic you could also do with. You're trying to get somebody to make it make that decision and to say yes and to sign on the dotted line. Just like you worry that they're not interested in you, you could do the same thing with them. Well, maybe we should set, you know, now's probably decision time. Should we set up another meeting or or are we, you know, are we done and you're just gonna find other representation? Right? I have yeah. that experience personally, especially the lean in, lean out in my in my office with mm -hmm. uh, clients. I have sometimes not purposefully leaned back in my chair, and I all of a sudden felt like I was coming off as too relaxed, like I didn't care about their their issue. It just kind of automatically triggered in my mind, and I immediately came back to my desk because I didn't want the potential client to think that I wasn't really listening. Mm -hmm. It was just a, a reaction. I was just getting a little more relaxed, but I had that feeling like you're saying that they might think I'm disengaging and I have caught myself coming back. Uh -huh. um, and similarly, I have wondered when I see them move, move back, you know, what are they, where are they at in this process of our mm -hmm. conversation? Maybe it's information overload. I mean, particularly right. in administ state administration and estate planning, there's sometimes so much information that people's eyes are like boggling. Mm -hmm. So I, the lean in and out for me in particular has a lot of meaning. And I, I mean, the other two, I think it's interesting that what that connects to, but I personally have experience with that third mm -hmm. one. And if other people, um, would like to share their experiences. Go ahead and write that yeah, in. Yeah, put some stuff in the chat box. Um, what I will say about the lean in and back, it's also recuperative for individuals. Basically, you can only go so far forward, right? Until you you literally fall over. And so, if you if you have a client that you know that is usually in this front space that tends to be a leaner. And that's just their habit. Um, you will have you will see them have to recline because they need it's that just as you said, it's it's a physical overload for them. It might not be mental, but physically they kind of overloaded themselves and their and their balance is off and where their center is being held is for that length of time, if they're really into into the conversation and they're yeah, yeah, and they're talking, they're taking notes and they're leaning over the table, they will have to find a moment to recuperate. Literally their body has to, has to recline to go, okay, now we can go forward again. <laughs> you know, we need that mm -hmm. break. Just like somebody will be sitting on one side and then you'll notice they, they switch to the other side. Like literally we, our bodies like balance. We are symmetrical, right? We have the two sides and now our faces aren't symmetrical, but uh, one side's always higher than the other. But our body does enjoy the symmetry of the way we were made. So head, shoulders, knees, and toes, like straight up and down. You know, they, so sometimes the body itself needs to be. that to, a good song? Head, no, I've Head, shoulders, knees. I use it in my <laughs> TED Talk, actually. I sing head, shoulders, knees, and toes because that's how they... <laughs> Um, that's how I'm make, making everybody remember to my keep you thinking um, posture, right? Well, you know, you just crossed your arms. So that makes me think, what's your comment about crossed arms? Crossed arms happen to be the most comfortable position for me. And I have been told that I, it, it's very uh, almost like, um, almost offensive. Like it's off a offensive, yeah, offensive position or something. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is so much out there that crossed arms means that I'm closed off to you that usually I tell clients just avoid it because you just it's one of those things you just don't know. Uh, I say if you see it in somebody else, you need to look at the entire picture of what's going on. If they're if they're close, if they're like this and they're still leaning in and they're listening and they're then they're nodding and they're keeping eye contact. They, they're just doing this because it's convenient or there's no arm on their chair or it could be cold in the room. It, 
There are so many other reasons why somebody could have their arms crossed that it's been debunked by just about every single body language person out there. But for some reason, it's still listed on every single blog that you see of the do's and don'ts in an interview and the do's and don'ts. Of, yeah. So we just we can't avoid it. So usually I say try not to if you can, if you can avoid it, um, you know, find something else maybe to, to do instead, <laughs> instead. but um, yeah, it's just one of those things that you, that we yeah, can't, you we can't I, help. I hear you saying that it's still perceived as more of a negative position. And so mm -hmm. you should avoid it. Which is it. interesting that how many, how many of the business photos that you see on LinkedIn is somebody like this, right? Mm -hmm. That's what every photographer wants you to do. Even on the, even in my TED talk, the dude, the, the guy that was the photographer was like, okay, so cross your arms and stand there. I said, I'm a body. I, I, I did it and I laughed and I said, you know, I'm a body language expert. I would never tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Or I said, I said, I, you would never catch me doing this or something like that. Um, so, or, so, or, you know, this is one I can't use. This is a picture I won't be able to use, but um, <laughs> because of that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, let me see where we're at. If, you know what? Go ahead and check the chat box if you. Um, there's a couple more on this section. Bobblehead or bust. This is. Um, I tend to be more of a bobblehead than I am of a of a of a straight bust. But uh, it might be something to tell others. If you notice in their square, if they really use a ton of head movement, it's hard to focus on them if they're way overly you know, bebop and jazz and whatever. I don't know if they got music going on in their head. But um, but the opposite of that is just as bad or, or honestly probably worse is to be just so stiff. This is where ladies, we're rocking it on Zoom more than men. I have to tell you, dudes, you tend to be more straightforward from the chest up. There isn't as much movement. You might, you're, you tend to get a little bit into head banging sometimes, that pressure. When something's not going right, I say I see more men do it to the headbang thing than women. But women, we like to use our upper body because we hug people, we hold the babies, and we do all that. We're just more facile here. And men with your jackets on, here it is. This is why I wore it because this tends to stiffen us up and keeps us a little bit more restrained. So I would suggest if you don't have to do the tie and the jacket for Zoom, give yourself as much play as possible so that your upper body is engaged. This is the signal of collaboration is using your shoulders and your chest. And this is where you're going to see those signals or be able to signal to somebody, okay, let's wrap it up now. I'm leaning forward. I want you to move on. I want you to keep moving. This is going too slowly. Uh, if you're too stiff, that what you you just your presence will be diminished on zoom which is why and i love that women finally have equality our box is the same size as everybody else's box so it's it's now or now or never ladies this is our time <laughs> to to rock it on zoom and to go for the raise and um because just in general the difference between male and female patterning women come across better on zoom we tend to smile more too um, Addison, so, real quick, I just yeah. wanted to uh, point out, because we've been talking about all these detailed nuances of body language, and an hour has flown by. I know. So <laughs> I, I want to let everybody know that um, CLE credit is pending, and wait, as long as you're on for an hour, you are um, allowed the credit. Now, Allison has agreed to stay on to continue with her content, but certainly if you have other things to do or you have other places to go, you know, I get it completely. Um, I just wanted to take this moment to for that transition to happen. Allison, why don't you, if you have any last minute takeaways for anybody that needs to get off, um, go ahead and, you know, take a minute to say them. And sure. Then we can kind of continue back for another what, whatever you have five ten minutes to finish yeah. up with your content. Really, the last the last piece is the fastest um, anyway. So the the only thing about communication is just that we have to in some ways over communicate when we're virtual because we're not getting the body language signals that we normally would. 
we need to go back over the agenda per hour, make sure that we're explicit and we say the agenda at the, at the start of the meeting or that we go over things at the end. So, so just to review, our next steps are, and that is more explicit because they didn't get any uh, priority signals from you during the meeting probably. In a, in a large setting or in a group setting, you in, you, your instinct starts to take over and you realize, oh, this, this is more important because of the way your boss was behaving <laughs> when he's talking about this project. So you sort of know intuitively, I should do that first. On Zoom, sometimes we don't really get those signals and it can be something that just either got missed because it wasn't heard, it was garbled or you froze at that moment. And usually people don't have people go back at least in my experience, I know if somebody freezes, unless I feel like I, I had to hear what they just said when they come back, I don't ask them to go back and repeat themselves because I don't know if they froze on everybody's or if it was just me or I, unless it goes on for a long time. If it's like a five or 10 second freeze maybe, but if it was just a few seconds where I missed a little bit, I and that might be what was important and somebody missed it on your team. So at the end, go back over everything. Um, Vocal variety, just like we need to keep as much body language signals going, the more you can use vocal variety in your pitch, in your speed of, of speaking, that will also help people know what's more important or what's not. When you, uh, something that's louder tends to have more importance than something, uh, that is, that is normal or something that's a lot softer than what it, that makes people lean into the old preschool teacher trick, right? I'll wait and they just get real quiet. And then suddenly the room goes <laughs> and then everything, then they, they pay attention again. So use all of that to your advantage if you can. Um, focus, we talked about Zoom fatigue. So we'll uh, wiggle, feel free, free to wiggle. That's my what I tell people when they say, oh, I get so tired of these Zoom meetings. I'm like, nobody can see you from the waist down. Wiggle all you want. Stretch your legs. Because right now I'm stretching and nobody knows, right? I'm under the table and I'm rolling my ankles and I'm stretching and you can't, or you know, <laughs> you don't know that I'm getting ants in my pants right now the, uh, from the length of the meeting, right? So stretch all you want during the meeting. And then culture. Just figure that out for your company. If you, if, if your company is super, re super relaxed, bring that into the Zoom. You know, ask you know, have that, still have that relationship and ask about the client's kids and whatever that, you know, that you know about them. Go ahead and try to keep that culture. Sometimes I think Zoom makes us very businesslike and very um, stick into business. So if, if that's not your culture, bring it into Zoom. Uh, yeah, so don't be like these people. <laughs> be better. We can, we can all be better. Uh, and I think that's pretty much the end. Yeah, so we're up, up at questions, definitely link in with me. Um, I have a class that's um, that's coming up on the 23rd and the 25th where we're going to practice Zoom and I'll look at everybody's nonverbals and give coaching tips um, in yeah, the moment. So can yeah. you, uh, could you take a minute and give me an example of how you coach? Do you talk more about kind of the science of it or do you just get into uh, do you give me, let's say, a quiz or a test? Say, I want you to try and sell me something. And then you give me feedback? I mean, how, what is your method? Yeah, um, well, the, the practice <coughs> excuse me, is, is literally, uh, I'll throw a topic out there, very generic topic, and um, even something like, okay, so what's your biggest pet peeve on Zoom? And we just have a conversation. And then I pick out, and then I would pick out certain things uh, to highlight. Okay, you notice that she leaned in there. Did you feel like that was more important when she leaned in? Because oh, right. Because and, you know what? How does the proximity to the screen affect how you feel about things? And I'll also give uh, give tips about probably how they're being perceived on the screen as well. Uh, I do a lot of this one on one, but I decided to also do like a class version so it's more affordable uh, for everybody to just have that. We, we practice presentations, but we don't practice our 
virtual communication. Yeah, we, yeah. we don't practice the virtual part. So this is a two hour time to just chat with people. It's great for networking too. You'll get to know your neighbors uh, on the call and and just get that that feedback because I might even um, you know say something like you just just watch. You are a little bit of what I call the bobblehead. So. Just notice that that if that's all somebody's seeing on the screen, that becomes really amplified. So even if it wouldn't bother me live in person with you sitting, you know, 10 feet away from me in Zoom, if you're really close and you're just like in your head constantly bobbles the whole time, it's a totally different perception. Mm -hmm. And and we need to be aware of what our own habits are. We don't tend to tell each other these things. Uh, unless you have a really good friend that will tell you, do you realize? Or you a do? child. <laughs> or a child. They're real. They're really good, aren't they? They're so good. Uh, yes. I Mama, did a. I did a. I did a, uh, a video on popping, like vocal popping, when people at the beginning of when they talk and it <laughs> they make this noise. Yeah. And of course, my son was in the room with me when I did it. And so then for days afterwards, there you go, mom, you just did it. You just did the thing you told everybody else not to do. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> they're great at it. Uh, and it may be, you know, you have also practiced with your family members. I don't know how many of you had family Zoom calls, but we sure had that Easter call and the Mother's Day call and the uh, with relatives that we'd never had before, but suddenly we felt like we weren't. Um, getting together, even though we wouldn't have it <laughs> regardless. So we're meeting on Zoom. So use those times to practice too, or to get your, your sibling to tell you point blank. We have a question that came do. through for oh, you. Yeah. The question is, some people suggest that you take your own view off of the Zoom meeting. And what's your opinion on that suggestion? If it makes you more comfortable, do it. If you don't mind, you having yourself watch you, which I do enough of my own videos and have finally gotten over that because I've had to edit, I do them all my own editing. So I know I know the stuff that I do that makes me roll my own eyes at myself. <laughs> but boy, if I were my client, I would tell them to do that, you know, to not do this <laughs> or to do that. Uh, so I'm used to it, but if it makes it easier for you to just not see yourself, I'm all for it. Um, you just have to remember where to go get yourself back if you need to. That's the thing that usually I forget. I'm like, oh, crap, work. Where is so it? You know. It almost sounds like a little bit of cost benefit analysis on whether you should take your own view off. If it bothers you uh, high, to a point high enough that it's detrimental, then it's worthwhile to turn off. But, mm -hmm. but am I correct in understanding that you think it's probably more beneficial to keep your visual presence on as long as it's not a detriment. Yeah, I, it, as long as it doesn't bother you to, to see yourself, if you've gotten kind of used to the idea that you're talking and watching yourself at the same time, uh, it, I don't know that it necessarily hurts anything. Of course, after a a session like this where I've given you all these things to think about, you might want to turn it off so that you're engaged and you're not distracted by, oh, am I doing all of those things that uh, that I was either warned about or, oh, how, how am I using my shoulders? I'm using my shoulders. If that's distracting you because of that, then I would take it off. But otherwise, I don't think it, I don't find that it hurts people, but I, I hear more often than not that people don't like to watch themselves. So I have a feeling once people know that trick of turning their thing off, more people will do it. So are you saying when you turn your when you turn yourself off, it's only off to you? Yes. But it's on to everybody else. Okay. I think yeah. I missed that part. I didn't Yeah, I that. wouldn't turn off your I wouldn't turn off your video to everybody else, particularly if um if it hasn't been stated that this is a call that we're running on Zoom, but we're gonna treat it like a conference call. Because I think there's always a little bit of that, well, why does she get to turn her screen off and I don't? Like, why do okay. I have to be there, yeah. right? There's I was a thinking bit of that, that you were, of, it was going uh, off completely. Right, yeah. But now so if you just turn off your, I think it's called self-view. I, I, okay. I'm blanking out on what the name of the, the, the phrase is that you see. But it's something about, like, turn off self-view and then your picture to you goes off, but you're still seeing everybody else. 
Oh, mm-hmm. well, that almost makes me feel more self-conscious. If I can't oh, see yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't do like a quick check. Do I have something right. in my nose? Well, that's why I can always know where it is because you can turn it back on and double check yourself at any time. But I, that's usually my thing. I can get it off. And then I'm like, now that I've gone away, I don't have a box to hit. Or you have to really know your mute. Um, you know, if you have an external mic that you can mute on and off rather than needing your box to turn it on, on and off. So think about all of those things, you know. Um, Sometimes there's the moderator is controlling who's on and who's off. So then you definitely can do it because you don't have to control your own um, mute. Sometimes the the owner of the meeting will be doing that for you. Well, Allison, I want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I think it's very good information for everybody to know, especially in these times when we're all on camera a lot more than we ever thought we would be. Um, so thank, you. thank you again for agreeing to do this. I hope everybody out there got a lot of information as well that they could use. And um, with, uh, with the Friendly Lawyers, we are continuing these webinars on mental health and law practice management issues. We are still doing them weekly um, while we have these restrictions in place. And if you had any questions, you can always reach out to me directly or through Facebook. Um, we also have a website, friendly-lawyers.com. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to close out and close off. Have a good weekend.